spin locks versus sleep locks. What's the difference? If this question has been keeping you up at night, this is the video for you. Uh, this video is part of a series on the XV6 operating system kernel. And in this video, I'll be looking at the files sleeplock.h and sleeplock.c. Well, let me uh, cut to the chase and uh, address the question of the differences between spin locks and sleep locks by looking at the functionality. And we can see that it is essentially exactly the same. With any lock, we need an acquire function and a release function. Sometimes these are called lock and unlock. And we have those with both spin locks and sleep locks. Acquire versus acquire sleep, release versus release sleep. And we also have some functions to initialize the locks and to check to see whether we're holding the locks. So with a spin lock, those functions are called init lock and holding. And with sleep locks, we have similar functions called init sleep lock and holding sleep. Uh, with spin locks, we also have a couple of other functions called push off and pop off. Let's remember what uh, locks are all about. In any concurrent program, we have multiple threads. And those threads could be uh, executing on the same core as a result of uh, time slicing. Or we could have multiple cores, and each core is uh, executing a separate thread of control. But in any case, we have data structures that are shared between the different threads, and they must be properly protected. And we use locks to protect uh, the shared data. So every lock protects a group of related data structures, and every uh, data structure that is uh, accessed by more than one thread, uh, where it's being used concurrently, needs to be protected by some lock. And whenever we access the shared data, we need to acquire the lock and hold it while we are either reading or writing uh, the data we can uh, say that whenever we access the data, and by accessing we mean either reading or writing, we must be holding the lock. So every bit of the shared data must be protected by a lock, and whenever we access anything that is shared, we need to be holding uh, the lock. We need to do an acquire operation before we uh, read or modify the data, and then after we are done with the shared data, we need to release the lock so that others can access the shared data. So the time between the acquire and the release is often called the critical section, and that's where we are allowed to access the shared data. And we must not access the shared data. Even reading it is dangerous. We must not access the shared data outside of the critical section. Okay. So uh, with data, there are invariants that describe what the data is supposed to uh, be like, or the invariants that describe uh, what is true of the data structure. Uh, within the critical section, we are modifying the data, and so momentarily these invariants may be violated, and usually are violated. But before we release the lock, we have to get the data in its uh, consistent form, so it can, uh, because other threads may access it the moment we release the lock. So it's, it, we also talk about the data being in an inconsistent state within the critical section. So with a spin lock, we must not hold the lock for very long. That's the key requirement. And in particular, uh, while we are in the critical section, the code must not sleep. Okay, we grab the lock, we acquire the lock, uh, quickly uh, access the data, and then fairly soon thereafter release the lock. No time slicing and no uh, sleeping. And um, that means that uh, we don't ever have to wait. Another thread will never have to wait for very long in order to obtain the lock. So with a spin lock, if, the, if some thread is trying to obtain the lock and it's unavailable, that thread can just spin. So the acquire function will just have a tight so-called spin loop when it just checks over and over if the lock is available. So this requirement that we can't hold the lock for very long is oftentimes difficult to meet. Uh, in certain situations. So that's what spin, uh, sorry, that's what sleep locks are for. We are allowed to hold a sleep lock for a long period of time. And in particular, we can sleep while we are holding the lock. And uh, the consequence of that is in the acquire sleep function, uh, if the lock is unavailable, that function uh, will have to wait a long time. 
and in particular, it will sleep until the lock becomes available. We talked about how spin locks were uh, implemented in a previous video, and they're using some sort of a function that will both read and modify data in an atomic operation. For example, a test and set operation or a compare and swap operation. The implementation for sleep locks is simple. We will just use spin locks in the implementation of sleep locks. So with that said, we can go straight into talking about the code. First, let's look at how the sleep lock is defined. So it's a structure called uh, sleep lock, and it has a flag variable, which is uh, one if the lock is held, and zero if the lock is free and available. And then it has a spin lock, and this spin lock protects the other fields, okay? It protects the lock field in particular. We also have a name field and a process ID field, which are used, uh, we can uh, set those and, and then print them out if we need to during debugging. So those are not really critical to the function. Okay, now let's look at the uh, functions. And the entire uh, file, sleeplock.c, just consists of these four functions. So they're pretty straightforward. To initialize the sleep lock, we are passed a pointer to a sleep lock and a name, and we uh, initialize the spin lock here that's in that lock, and we also initialize the name, and we set the lock field to indicate that this lock is not currently held and no process ID. Now to acquire the lock, well, we are going to be setting the lock flag to true. We'll also set the process ID to the process ID of the currently running thread. And since these are protected by the spin lock, we need to acquire it first, and then we need to release it. So we acquire it, uh, and then we check to see whether someone else, some other thread, is already, already holding the lock. And if some other thread already has the lock acquired, then we need to sleep. And remember with the sleep function, we uh, pass it uh, a channel, and the channel will be the address of the sleep lock itself. Okay? And we need to be holding a spin lock, which is then released while we are asleep. So here we're passing it. Uh, the spin lock, okay, that we have inside of the sleep lock, and that is released while we're asleep. And uh, when someone else signals this channel, then we'll wake back up uh, with the spin lock reacquired, and then we'll go check again. And eventually this loop will uh, find that it is not locked, set it to locked, and uh, then release the spin lock, and the critical section can then proceed. Releasing an assembler, uh, we will be setting the lock flag to false and clearing out the process ID. But of course, we have to acquire the spin lock since we will be accessing the fields that are protected by the spin lock. So we acquire the spin lock, and then here's the matching release. Uh, but before we release it, we also want to wake up any other sleep locks that might have gone to sleep. So we're now releasing the lock, and it could be that there are other threads that are uh, in this loop here sleeping, and we need to wake them up so that one of them can grab the lock and proceed. The um, holding sleep function is uh, pretty straightforward. We just ask whether the lock is currently held and whether the process that is holding the lock, the process ID here, is equal to this current thread's process ID and return that as a Boolean. Uh, but of course, since we're accessing the locked and the PID field, we need to be holding the spin lock. So we acquire that and then we release it here. So that's all there is to a sleep lock, very simple. And these are only used in two places. Uh, in the buffer cache, we see that each buffer has a sleep lock. And so when a buffer is acquired with the B read function, that uh, sleep lock will be acquired. And the other place we use um, sleep locks is with inodes. And so we'll see that each inode data structure also contains a sleep lock. Okay, that's it. See you in the next video.